Our scripture this morning, as you may well anticipate, comes from the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 8 today, verses 22 through 26. Mark chapter 8, beginning with verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees, walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. Let's pray. Lord, you have revealed yourself to us through your word, and you've given us the task of looking into it intently, and I pray that you would help us as we do that now, throughout the rest of the week, you would help us to understand and you would prick us in the heart where we need it, that our desire would be to be faithful and obedient to you and to draw near to you. I pray that you would use me this morning as you see fit, pray that our hearts are prepared and that you would help us to be not hearers only, but doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. As you have been uh, dutifully reading the book of Mark, I'd like to suppose, you probably notice that there are a lot of miracles recorded. Seems like miracle after miracle. Mark is the only gospel in which there are more miracles than there are chapters because he, he puts forth so many. It's, he's writing to the Gentiles and it's as if he's trying to say, I desperately want you to believe this man is the Son of God. Here's a miracle. Do you believe it? No, here's another one. An endless parade, it seems, in the book of Mark, and you may have noticed that. So I chose this morning to to share with you this one, for us to look together into this one uh, for two reasons. One, this miracle is one that only Mark records. And two, there is an unusual element in this miracle that you may already have noticed that we don't find in any other of the miracles that are recorded of Jesus. So we're going to look into this and uh, see what we can learn from it. Jesus didn't come to the earth to do miracles. Jesus came to earth by his own uh, profession to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to be the word of God made flesh and to reveal the plan of God. And in the meantime, he did, he taught he did miracles. Miracles were the things that he did, but he didn't, he didn't come for that purpose. They were the means to his end uh, of, of why he was doing it. I'd like to share with you three reasons why, why Jesus apparently did miracles as we find that revealed in Scripture. One, it was to prove that he was who he said he was. There are a lot of false Christs back at that time. There were a lot of people who, who studied and understood the Old Testament and knew that it was about the time to expect the Messiah. And many came along and claimed to be the Messiah. I am the one. I am the Christ for whom you've been waiting. But Jesus proved it with the miracles that he performed. The second reason that he, did, that he did miracles is that he had love and compassion for the people. You see someone standing before you with, a, with an illness or an impairment of some kind, and you have the power to do it. Jesus had compassion, and he healed them. Jesus did not do miracles out of coldness or, or, or in an uncaring way. Okay, there, your, your foot is healed, thank you. And he, You always see in the miracles that are recorded the passion and the compassion that Jesus had toward those people and his love. And the third thing is he desired to bring people to repentance. Now think about what God the Father has done with Scripture. He has has revealed Himself and He has shown us His kindness. He has revealed Himself in His Word and God has showed His kindness to us uh, through His works of grace and mercy in order to get us to repent. That's what Jesus was doing when He did miracles. He was revealing who He was and He was showing kindness. As Romans 2 tells us uh, that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. So we're going to often see that when Jesus did a miracle, he got a great following. And he got more and more people asking him to do more and more. And oftentimes the people were more interested in the miracles than in the repentance that he was trying to, to draw from them. Easy to draw a crowd. But then when he laid down the hard truths 
of what they needed to do to be faithful and obedient and to surrender to him as Lord, then the crowds began to dwindle. You know, it's that way a lot in our churches today. Churches are trying everything under the sun to draw in a crowd. And oftentimes when the hard truth is laid down about self-sacrifice and obedience and faithfulness, that's when the crowd starts to lose their interest. So with that understanding that Jesus did those miracles for the reasons stated, let's look into some of the interesting details of this particular story in Mark chapter 8, beginning with verse 2. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. Now, this man was not blind from birth. How do we know that? Uh, as Doug Lucas shared with us last week, you know, you don't, you don't want to assume anything that's not in the text. Where does it say that? It doesn't come right out and say that he wasn't blind from birth, but we have two very good clues in this passage that we'll look at later. So somehow, through disease or through accident, this man was blind, and and blindness back then, you can just see all the stories where Jesus healed someone who was blind. You can get an idea that it was so much more common back then, so much less they could do for someone. And, and oftentimes the eyes, they would glaze over, they would, they would swell, they would ooze. There were, there were insects that they would have to shoo away. There were, there were things about blindness beyond not being able to see that made it such an unpleasant circumstance. And so this man, uh, not born not blind from birth, it's also possible that he wasn't really interested on his own in getting help from Jesus. It says some people, family, friends, we don't know, some people brought him to Jesus and they begged him to touch him. This man did not speak at first. We know he could speak because he does speak later on in this passage. He did not speak on his own. They brought him to Jesus and they asked and pleaded with Jesus to help him. Now, this man probably had no expectation that this Jewish man could help him. He probably, because of the area, probably was a Gentile. Then Jesus took his hand and started to lead him. And, and the man began to follow him. What else are you going to do? I mean, this, this man has, has obviously taken some interest in me. And I don't know what's going to happen. But he's taken my hand and these friends have brought me here. I will go, and I will see what happens. Now, two weeks ago, we talked about uh, the, the conversion of Matthew, how he got up from his table as a tax collector and followed Jesus, left everything to follow him. Uh, we, talked, we talked about how you should not give up on someone who is not yet saved, because they're, even the most hardened sinner may come, and it may take lots of prayer, may take action on our part, and, and we see in this story as well, most of the time, someone comes to Christ, just not on their own, out of the blue, but someone comes to Christ because other people are actively involved in leading them. So these friends come and lead him to Christ, and in verse 23, we read, and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? Do you see anything? But once again, the text does not say why he led him out of the village. But there are a couple of good possibilities that we might want to consider this morning. One likely reason that Jesus led him out of town was because he was chastising that city. As, as we learned in verse 22, they came to Bethsaida. Bethsaida is sort of famous in the, in the New Testament scriptures because of, of what happened there. There were a lot of miracles that took place in Bethsaida, but to very little effect. Like I said, Jesus could draw a crowd. He could draw many people wanting healing, but there was not a lot of repentance in the city of Bethsaida. So they were no longer worthy of having miracles done within their walls. This could be an act of chastisement that Jesus leads the man out of the village because they've seen enough already and they're not responding. I think what he says at the end of this passage is a clue when he tells him not to go back into the city. Matthew shed some light on this in Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 through 22. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon 
than for you. Who are Tyre and Sidon? A couple of very wealthy cities back in the time of Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied against them, warned them to repent, but that was nothing compared to having Jesus in your city performing great works. And Jesus says to Bethsaida and Chorazin, if you, if you would have had, if, if Tyre and Sidon had had the, the display of mighty works that you have, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes long ago. That is a principle we find in the ministry of Jesus. Something he passed on to his disciples as well. And that is, if, you're, if the people aren't responding, then move on. Shake the dust off of your feet and move on if they're not responding and not coming in faith and repentance and in belief. He, he said elsewhere, do not cast your pearls before swine. If they're not responding, move on. You know, there's a lot of debate among Bible scholars about this question. I'm sure you've heard this question. Maybe you've asked it yourself. So what, what happens to those who have never heard the name of Jesus? Somebody in the, the deepest part of you know, the African continent or somewhere never have been missionaries or whatever. What happens to those who've never heard the name of Jesus? And uh, you know, the, the possible answers in the debate about that is outside the scope of what we're doing here this morning. Uh, several things have been bandied about, about how much they're responsible, and, and Romans 1 is used and things like that. But there is no debate whatsoever about the question, what about those who've had plenty of opportunity? What about those who have the Word of God all over the place? What about those in Bethsaida who had the works of God being done by Jesus all over and yet did not come in repentance? So that's one reason that Jesus might have taken the man out of town because there had been done enough and they weren't responding. Another possible reason they took him out of town is to avoid ostentation, to avoid being, being showy. That's, you know, one of the three temptations that are mentioned when Jesus was in the wilderness. And, and maybe you've read that and, and, like me, thought it was strange that Jesus was really tempted by that, is when he was taken up to the very highest point of the temple, and the devil said, hey, you know what, why don't, why don't you cast yourself off of here because it is written that he will command his angels concerning you and they, they will let you down to the ground unless you cast your foot against the stone. And Jesus said, get away from me. It is written, you shall not put the Lord God to your test. But you wonder, could that have been? We know the three temptations were tempting to Jesus. The other scriptures verify that each one of them, he was tempted to jump off and be let down by the angels because how quickly could he convince everyone that he was, was the Christ? In the Sermon on the Mount, we are told two things that seem contradictory, but they're not. One is to let our lights shine, let our good works shine, that others may see our good works and glorify God who is in heaven. And at the same time, the Sermon on the Mount tells us not to do our things for show, to, like to pray or to give or to blow trumpets to turn people's head. Well, how do we reconcile that? Well, there is a balance there. That we don't hide the things we do. We don't hide our good works so that no one sees, no one knows, and we're like a secret Christian. But we also don't do it with flash and show and pomp and other, in, in, in order to show off. And Jesus is perhaps striking a balance here. So many works have been done, and now he's going to take this man off uh, to a side where it's a, it's a private place. There's a need for balance. One of those two reasons, probably true. I, I think, in my opinion, that he took them out. He took them out because Bethsaida had had their opportunities. Well, let's consider the method through which Jesus healed this man in this passage. You know, Jesus could have simply spoken the words and the man would have been healed of his blindness, his eyes open and everything been seen clearly. That's not what he did. Instead, he he spit on his eyes, and he touched his eyes. It doesn't say why he did that. I think a very good, reasonable explanation for this is, is to draw this man into more faith. Jesus liked to help those who were showing little morsels of faith. And I think he's drawing him along and increasing his faith as he goes. You know, he, he stood there, didn't say anything, and, and, and now suddenly... There's something on his eyes and he's being touched. And, and he says to him, do you see anything? And that leads us 
into what separates this miracle from all the other ones that are recorded by Jesus. In verse 24, And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. You think that is strange. Jesus spat on his eyes, he touched him, and the man is not completely healed. It's like, what's, what's going on here? Has, has Jesus lost his touch? Did he need to try it again? Maybe, maybe touch him in a different way? Well, we understand that Jesus never made a mistake. Jesus never failed. So Jesus has a reason for just partially healing the man, and I think it's once again drawing out the man's faith. And, when, and, and it, we weren't there to hear the tone of voice that this man used when he finally spoke. But how could it be anything other than building expectation? I see men, but they look like trees walking. Again, that's how we know he was not blind from birth. He has some idea of trees. He has some idea of men and, he's, and, and what walking looks like. And he sees the forms even though it's not clear. So, <clears throat> and so, like a grown-up, who walks with a toddler and keeps pace at the toddler's pace. Just little step by little step, Jesus is drawing this man's faith forward. And we see in verse 25, Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. That man progressively showed faith. That man was completely healed. Now, I don't know whether Jesus intended this or not, but he has given us an object lesson here. There's something about this story that parallels our real lives and our salvation. And that is, our spiritual blindness does not go away all at once. When we are, when we are unsaved, the Bible describes that as we are in darkness, we are spiritually blind, and we need someone else to cure us of that, and that's Jesus when he saved us. But when we are first saved, there are still important things that we don't understand, things that we don't know. And it won't be until we enter into glory that everything is made clear for us finally once and for all, and we will see him as he is. But in the meantime... We are called to, to make our eyes see better and more clearly. This is, this is what's described in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, when it says, but the, path of righteous, uh, but the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter unto full day. Now, we are the church. One of the many terms that is used to describe the church is the body of Christ. In this story, Christ gradually opened the eyes of a man. In our real life, the task of the church is to open the eyes of those who wish to see more clearly day by day who the Lord is and how to know him better, to bring believers along to maturity. That's what we do. That's why the church has put us here. That's why God has revealed himself in his word and called us together to study that together. In verse 26, it says, And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not enter the village. So apparently the man did not live in Bethsaida. And Jesus, Jesus told him not to go back into that town, probably because then they would see the miracle. They, they, had, been, they, they had had that opportunity withdrawn from them. They had seen enough. They had lacked interest. They didn't even follow Jesus and the man out of town to see what was going to happen. And so he gives them over. So many miracles in the gospel of Mark to help convince us that Jesus was who he said he was and the power and the compassion and the desire for our repentance that he has. And these miracles dispel that common notion that's still out there today that Jesus was just a great man that Jesus was just a great teacher. It was C.S. Lewis who wrote in, uh, in Mere Christianity that we cannot just say, well, Jesus was an excellent, wonderful man, a great moral teacher. Jesus has not left that option open to us. You cannot be a great moral teacher and say some of the things that Jesus said 
Uh, it's, it's just not possible. Either when he, when he claimed to be God, when he claimed to be God in the flesh, when he told people that he was the only way to heaven, he was one of three things. He was either a liar telling something that wasn't true at all, he was a lunatic saying things out of his mind, or he is the Lord. Great moral teacher is not an option. And Jesus did these miracles to prove that he was the God in flesh that he says he is. And if he is Lord, then we had better not downplay what that means for us individually in our lives. That means Jesus is in charge. He owns us. He has bought us with a price and he has the authority to say, if you wish to come after me, you must deny yourself daily. Take up your cross and follow me. May it be that we listen and we surrender to him as Lord. Let's pray. Thank you again, Lord, for your word, and for the things that you teach us, for the things that have been recorded for, for our benefit. I pray that these things would stir within us a desire to keep knowing you more, to keep being more Christ-like, and a desire to see others come to know you as well. Would you fill us with that desire? And help us to be about your business and give honor and glory to you as sold out servants submitting to your lordship. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here this morning who has not received you as Lord and Savior, that you would work on their hearts and help them to understand the importance of this urgent matter. Pray that you would help us to be witnesses when we leave here. That you would help us always to have on our minds the task that is before us, helping others to find peace with you through your Son. Thank you again for your, your grace and mercy and your patience with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Every Sunday we give the opportunity at the end, and the, when the song is over, the invitation is not over, uh, but we give, a, we give a time, a segment in this service, if you'd like to make publicly known your desire to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, to come and, and make us aware of that so that we can, we can pray with you and make arrangements to, to look into the Scripture about this important matter. If you're a baptized believer and you'd like to officially identify yourself with this body, we invite you to come forward for that as well or for any spiritual need that you'd like to share with us as we stand and sing our invitation to song this morning.